All right. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The presentation we're going to do this afternoon is slightly different from the normal ones in as much as I'm going to go back to basics. And the basics will help you in many ways, especially for the, for the people that's starting out the journey and wants to make sure that after five years or three years, well, it takes on average about five and a half years, that they actually are geared and ready to do the, the, the submissions to EXA. Now, to be able to do that, you need to have a few things in place. And this is now experience talking. So if we look at the, the slides of the program that I've put together, the first one is, but why? Why do we want to go down this road? What is the deal with it? Then I'm going to share some tools with you that might or might not, but will most probably help you. We're going to look at the development cycle because that fits straight into the tools that you're going to use. Use and then the IPD form, we're quickly going to have a look at that because that's one of the forms you can use immediately. And then important information, I'm going to elaborate on that. Then I'm going to look at the structure. If you're going to keep a record of your activities in the Q&A session. All right, those are the, the seven topics I'm going to handle. The first one is about why. Now, hear me when I tell you this. The majority, if not all of them, that I've helped so far with a professional registration, I ask them, what is the biggest mistake you've made? Or what is the biggest regret that you've got? And the number one that always comes up says, you I did not keep a record of my activities, my projects, the stuff that I worked on. And that is a problem for me. Now that I'm sitting down and I'm doing my training and experience reports and my engineering report, I am battling to figure out what the hell did I do three or five years back? What projects, projects that I worked on? What is the detail of those projects? So my question to you is, how good is your memory five years from now, reflecting back on training or drafting your training and experience report and saying, radio, now what did I do then? Well, I worked on that project, but so how good your memory? I don't think anybody is, is that good. Then can you remember the projects that you worked on? Which outcomes did you cover? Which means you need to know your outcomes, but if you try and think back, can you remember? Can you remember on what level you were operating and can you link that to your projects? With, in other words, I did this project, this is what I did on the project, these outcomes I managed to deal with and I did it on this level. So think about that. And there's a reason why I say that's the biggest regret of all of the people that I've, that I've spoken to at the point of professional registration. Then also what training did you do? If you do webinars and you do all of these other activities, can you remember all of them? Have you got a record of all of them? You know, that's that initial professional development. And then also, can you remember five years back, whether I'm talking now in the future or currently looking back five years, can you remember who's the supervisors? Do you even know where they are? And this is going to be a weird question, but are they even alive still? And what are you going to do when they're not, when you eventually find them? or if they sit in Australia or one of those places. That is the why. That is why it's important to document your stuff, document it now and get into that, ha that habit. Now, the tools that, that, that we're going to talk about. The first one is you can keep a diary. So you go and you buy yourself a diary every single day, morning or night, call it journaling if you like. You pull the diary out and you sit down and you say, right, this is the project that I worked on. This is the information that I gathered during that project. These are the stuff that I work on. And when I say stuff, I mean the 11 outcomes. I mean the activities. I mean the problems that you solved. So when I use that, that term loosely, always remember that's what I refer to. And it's great to have a diary and one should, and you can you know, do quite a bit with it. You can even create a diary that you can use for every single project and refer back to it. So what are the pros with it? Well, it's easy to use. It's not a problem. You go and buy one and there you go. So you can use one for every project. You can have different colors for your projects if you want to. You don't need a computer. I know there's still people that likes the old school of writing stuff down. So you've got the opportunity to write again, which is great. And there are people that does that. But I'll tell you now, there are no people that's got, I know a lot of candidates that do not have a diary. They do not have a, um, 
template to work on. They've got nothing. They go through the projects, they gain their experience, but they don't keep a record of it. And that's why it becomes challenging. Now your cons to this, oh, it's gonna cost you some money to go and buy diaries for this. Um, your diary is not always with you. Your outcomes are not listed in your diary. You need to go and document them themselves. That goes for the levels as well, the levels, levels of competency. You need to go and structure your diary so it can meet those needs. So you need to set it up first before you go down the, that, that um, road. And there's also difficult to find stuff. Now, once again, the stuff here, I mean your project. So if you've got a project and you need to go back and now start writing your training and experience reports, then you need to go through all of those papers to go and find the appropriate information that you're seeking for. So those are the pro, pros and cons. And, and this, it's really a personal thing here. Your second one that you can use, you can already now start downloading the training and experience report and start putting your information on there. Great initiative, great way to start, start off on this project, or even if you're already in the process to look back and start doing it. The pros of that is a direct capture. This is what EXA wanted. This is a formal document. You capture the stuff on there. So all the information is there, it's ready. You don't need to take your diary or whatever you use and transfer that information onto this one again. So it's only one document that you're going to use and you're going to populate it. Now the cons on that, well, EXA changes their forms from time to time. So you might find yourself in a position where you've now documented all of that, great. Now EXA goes and changes the format or change some of the outcomes or whatever the case might be. Then you've got a problem, then you have to redo it. So you need to, at the end of the day, go back and edit it again, right? And also when you do your documentation and you write your programs, you're going to use a lot of words. So you need to go back to the training and experience report and cut it down. So now you start editing and it gets messy when you start cutting it down. And when you've deleted something, yeah, it's gone. So it's not electronic. If you don't have a backup and your system gets stolen or fails or there's a fire or something, you don't have a backup, this is gone. You'll never have it again. So it's difficult to update that. That's the pros and cons. That's your second tool that you can use. Your third tool is the workplace training plan and assessment record. If you want it, I've designed this for, for candidates so you can use the system as well. It's got two sections to it. The left side is the candidate's plan and record. And on the right side is the mentors um, and supervisors review and assessment. I've tried to create this as close as possible to your training and experience report. It's an Excel spreadsheet. You can manipulate it. There is some coding in there that helps you with the council outcomes and the levels. So what do you have here? You have on the left your project name and number. You've got your responsible supervisor. That's on your TER as well. You document it there. Your project activities, it's also on your, on your training and experience report. Here is an overview of it. Something to trigger your memory. Something to say, that is what you worked on. That was your designation. These were the problems that you were facing. This is the solutions that you find to those problems. So that you put into your project activities. Then a start and end date, also in your TER. So you put it in there, the weeks that you worked on, your training and experience summary, very important. Those weeks need to reflect there. I've put in the state, status of the, of the progress so you can say whether the project is closed out or not, or you're still busy with it. Now, this is the important bit. If you now look at your project outcomes and design, now you've got your council outcomes. So here, there's a drop down menu, by the way. You can go and select the outcomes and link it to your project outcomes and designation. So I've tried to make it easy enough. But now you're going to say, yeah, but I need to find out. I can't remember all the outcomes. Yeah, the whole list will be there. But there's a tab in this spreadsheet that also, if you click on it, shows you the 11 outcomes and it shows you the various levels. The various levels. So then you've got the degree of responsibility. So you tick those boxes. A, being exposed to the environment. E is basically running with a project and you're ready to register. And remember, you have to do that for at least a year before you can uh, submit your application. On the right side, you then book your, meter, your, your mentor or your supervisor. 
So you put a date down there. It's good to keep a record of that. And it's also good for your mentor because they can use this document to submit for their CPD, the Continuum Professional Development, as a evidence that they've actually done the mentoring. Then you sit with your mentor or your supervisor and you assess the outcomes. You look at the outcomes, you look at the project and you say, yes, I agree with it. You change it, you do whatever you want to do with it during that process. Then after that, you assess the degree of responsibility and you and your mentor make comments on there and say, yes, it is. I'm happy with you being on BC. However, I think you need to move to D. So we need to put you on a project where you get more responsibility. So that goes into there. Then you've got the supplementary tra training. So if you go onto site and you need some occupational health and safety regulations training, well, construction regulations training, then you put it in there and your last column is like notes. What did I do? What do I need to do? So that you don't forget. We all forget, even the mentors, everybody forgets. So that information goes in there. So there's a template that you can use. It is literally like a dipstick. It's an overarching thing. It's a summary. But you will exactly at any given point see what's going on. You can also look at the, the pinkish kind of columns immediately and you can see if you're operating on level E or not. And you can immediately see which outcomes you've covered. So it's a very compounded and a very quick and dirty, if you like, tool that you can use to help you with your with your training and experience report and keeping a record of what you've done. That is the biggest problem. Then you've got another option. Now, in association with IPED, we've created this thing called the Workplace Training Plan. Now that same Excel spreadsheet that you've seen there, I've taken that one and I've put it onto the internet so that you've got a space and it's free to use that you can do exactly the same as that template, but just in much more detail and it's got a backup, so it will live there forever. So when you're done and dusted with your application for professional registration, that information will still sit there. You can delete your account. You can do whatever you want to with your account. So it's a space where you can immediately, doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can go there and update your inform information and carry on. I'm quickly going to run through it so that you at least see what it's all about, because it's difficult to see a picture and try and figure out what it is. So I'm going to stop share and then I'm going to go to, to the live site. Ah, there we go. Right. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So here's some more information about it. It's the development cycle. So I have basic information. It's about the app, but you don't have to know about the app because I'm going to show you now. So if you go here, you go and register. You put in your email address, that will be used, your username. We're not changing it so that you can put your own one in. But for now, put your email address in there, then your name and surname. Your user type, you're going to select candidate. This is important. If you're going to use this app and your company is not on here, please let me know so I can add the company for you. And the reason why we're doing it this way is so that there's only one Oricon on there, so all the Oricon people are together. And there's not Oricon Group Africa, then you know there's going to be a split in it. So it's just a security measure. So go there and you click on register the new one. And you sort it. Then you can go in and use the app. So if I now go to sign in, if you should go to sign in, then you'll land up on this page. So you will have a username and a password. You put it in there and you submit it. And here's your dashboard. So you can see how many progress, how many projects you got in progress, how many you've completed and total reviews that was done. It was nine in this case. Here you can have quick access to, to your projects if you choose to. So all your projects will sit here. I'm just going to go through the top buttons there so you can see what they all are and what they do. If you go to my profile, it says here, don't go and change your email address. And if you're going to change your email address, then follow this procedure. So it's a safety measure to build in because that's your username. But after you've done that, then you log in with your old um, password. You just use your new address for information's sake. Mentors, you can add your own mentors. You can ask your mentors to go and register on here. You've got project managers and portfolio managers. 
your project managers are the ones that you have linked to a project that does the reviews for that. Profile mentors are not necessarily linked to a project. You see, I've got two mentors. This is a demo account. I've got two mentors listed on my profile, but I've only got one mentor that's my pro that's my that's linked to my project. And that's the one that does the reviews with me. So you can have a lot and you can link them. If you've got three or four mentors and they all work on different projects, you can all link them here. Now, this is the important bit. Then you go to my projects. You can always add a new project and they will start filling out here. And you can quickly see there's five outcomes. And it's my first project, number one, demo, blah, blah, blah. So if you create a, a new one, it will look like this. All of these fields will be empty. And now this should start ringing a bell. Project number, project name, weeks that you worked on it, all of that information is here, date started, date end. Is it in progress? What's the deal here? What is your designation? That goes in there, your mentor, and this is where you can link your mentors, if they're on the system, remember? And here's your supervisor. So you put your supervisor in. You have to put this in and you're going to need this for your training and experience report. So this is electronic version of that to help you through the process. Here's your organogram. So you can put a table in, you can put all of the um, people in there if you want to. This is where you capture the nature of your activities, your problems that you solved, all of those outcomes that is so important. You document all of it. On this program, on this project, I did the following, I encountered following problems. Now, if you look at your activities or your project that you've now captured here, then you link your outcomes to it and say, all right, on this project, what did I do? I defined, investigate, and analyze problems. So you can add it here. On what level is it? Am I assisting? Am I participating? You can delete it if you want to. So that option is there as well. And if you now got more outcomes, you can add them here as well. They will add those ones. Here's supporting documents. So if you want to upload your DR or um, drawings or calculations for this project, you can upload it onto this. Then you have it. And obviously you go and save the project and it's sorted. That's your projects. Your reviews. Now remember that project that I showed you? It's a duplicate of it. So whatever you change here, change on your project. So whatever you change in your projects, change here. Now you'll see there's two buttons here, save no notification and save notify my mentor. All of these fields are blocked out because you're not going to change that. That is your project that you're working on. Now you sit with your mentor and say, right, these are the activities that I've worked on. I've now documented my whole project here. Let's review it. Then you sit with your reviewer and, or your mentor or supervisor and you say, let's assess the outcomes. Here's your outcomes on the right-hand side. You see them here? Let's assess them. Are we happy with it? Have I covered all of them? Cool. You document that information there. Then you go to the assess the degree of responsibility. Here's your degree of responsibility. So you check that, bounce it off your mentor, and your mentor and you can put in the comments here. So you've got now a full-blown record of what's going on. You can delete ones if you want to as well. So that option is there. Supplementary training. This is where you decide what kind of training do you need? What IPD training do you need? What exposure do you need? That gets captured here. And then recommendation and comments go in here. So you've got a full blown record of, of everything. You can also upload documents here that supports this, whatever you're doing. If you decide your mentor is not available, but you want to go and update your projects yourself, then you log into here. You make your changes, whatever you want to make changed. Then you click save and notify my mentor. I'm not going to do it now because I've got a demo mentor, then they're going to get the notification. Then your mentor will get a notification to say, you've made changes to the system. Go and see what the changes are and make sure that you're happy with them. If you sit with your mentor and you do it, if you sit in Australia and they sit in South Africa, you update it and you reload it then it will reflect the latest information that you've captured. So I've tried to make it as flexible as possible. So that is now your reviews. Then you've got a thing called my workplace training plan. This is a record, a paper or a, a thing that you can download or export if you want to for your CV, for record keeping, for whatever purpose you want to. You see that information that I showed you? Here it is. So everything pulls through. 
Here's your outcomes pulled through. Here's your degree of responsibilities pulled through. Now a review of the outcomes that goes in. Yes, we've got a record of, and you've got a record of all of those activities. It's a formal document so you can get your mentor to sign off and date it. Then it becomes a legal document. This is one project. So you will have underneath this the next project and the next and the next and the next. So all of your projects will be housed at one single point. Your HR people can be involved in this and they can see your mentors, they can see all the candidates. So it goes quite far. This is what we developed as a modern tool for candidates to use. It's going to log out and share, stop share, and let's get back to the presentation. Right, so that is now your workplace training plan. That is the one that's online and it's available once again for free. It's not going to cost you a cent. If you, if you want to use that, by all means, then go for it. How does the record keeping fall into place when it comes to um, your development, the developmental cycle? Now, the developmental cycle you can use for any and everything that you want to become an expert in. And I literally means anything that you want to, from playing golf to baking a cake to be a great soccer or rugby player. Well, you have to have a little bit of talent there. Eh? But if you apply this method or this, this cycle, you will become an expert. So the first thing you do is your, is your workplace training plan. You see it there, WPTP. That could be your diary. That could be your, uh, that template that I showed you. It could be, the online one, it could be your training and experience report. Any document that you plan, you sit there and plan, what am I going to do? What do I want to achieve? Where am I in the process? Which outcomes have I covered? What's my journey here? You put that down. After you've done it, you do it on your own. You sit and you draft it yourself. Then you book a meeting with your reviewer or supervisor and say, here's my plan. This is what I want to do. You're going to send me to site. On site, what do you expect from me? What is happening here? Which outcomes am I going to cover? Who am I going to deal with? On what level do you want me to operate? So you review it with your mentor or your supervisor. Then if everybody is happy, then you go, cool. Go to site or go to the design office or go and see the client. You need to get that exposure. That is your training and work activity. So you actually now take your plan and you execute it. And while you're executing that plan, that is where you start updating your diary, your workplace training plan, your training experience report, anyone that you have chosen that you want to use as your core to document your information. That information now goes into that training record that I'm talking about. Then you book your supervisor and mentor again. Then you bring that plan that you had and you show this is the plan that we had this is what i've done this is where i am now we need to plan the next stage i am now competent at site i've spent enough time there i know the occupational health and safety regulations pertaining to the construction regulations i've communicated with the, with the contractor so outcome number five is done i've done all of that i don't have design experience so let's plan that then you plan it, you review it with your mentor and your supervisor. Then you go and do the training and the work activity again and again and again. And you do this cycle over and over and over again. And if you do it properly, then after three to five years, you would be able to register as a professional. Your plan is in place. You've done all the outcomes. You're operating on the right level. You've got a record of all of those activities because you need to translate that onto your training and experience report and your engineering report. And by the way, if you do this for 10 years or 10,000 hours, you will be deemed an expert. And this is where the expert model comes from. You're not gonna get better than this. I promise you that. And that little loop, that circle that you go through, that's your development phase. Okay, nice one. <clears throat> one form or one record that you can start capturing now and you should because you don't have to design anything there's no app there's no nothing that you need for this put this in your in your filing system every time you've gone to a course 
you put this information on you. It's e easy enough, and don't get co confused between IPD and CPD. IPD is initial professional development. CPD is continuing professional development. So if anybody or, or somebody comes and tells you, you can only put CPD activities on you, that is nonsense. I can tell you that right now. What is important to, do, to, to, to put in here, and you'll see the comp compulsory fields, the date that you have attended, easy enough. Provider, what was it, SICE or IPED? You put IPED in there. Name of the course, um, toolbox talks for um, candidates. Hours, you spend an hour, two hours. Now you see the validating body. There's no validating body because it's not a CPD activity, it's an IPD a bit, um, activity. And there's no star, so you leave that open. Venue, this was virtual, a webinar. Lead presenter, you under worker, in this case it will be me. The type, it's a webinar. Points, well, there is no points because it's IPD, you don't need to claim points for it. Validation number, it's not a CPD event, so you don't put a validation number in. Simple, straightforward. How long did it take me? A few seconds to explain it to you. So you pull this out every time after you've gone to a training event, and that includes the toolbox talks that we're doing. That includes the lunch and learn that you have at your companies. That includes your informal training. You put that stuff down here. And it's important that the reviewers, when you do your application, wants to see that you've done these activities because if you're lazy and you don't do this now, what gives them the security that when you professionally register that you're actually gonna do CPD? And that is the underlying theme here. So this is a form, pull it out, keep it with you. Every time you go to these events, you document it. And you can thank me later when, when you do your professional registration. If you decide to use a diary or you want to do your own thing, please go ahead and do it. All I'm saying to you is please make sure that you capture the following 17 points. Your information, obviously, where are you in the process? How many years experience have you had? Make a little note there. There are candidates that are so, how many years experience have you got? Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, let me quickly think. When did I get my qualification. You see what I mean? Keep a record of it. Your current position, your designation, your role and responsibilities on that specific project that you're working on. What is the project all about? Write your story. What are the, the issues on the projects, the problems that you solve? What are you, or what have you learned on that day or during that week or on that project if you want to only do this, say once the project is done? The duration of the projects, you need to have the weeks. You, <laughs> you need to put it in your training and experience support. And what outcomes have been have you been exposed to? So you need to make at least a list of them. Um, on what level, that's obvious. What supplementary training that you do, that is a reminder for you to go and update your IPD form. Or if you do your diary, just write it down there. Your meeting notes and your reviewers meeting notes, that is important because that that will tell you that will quickly tell you what level you are, what progress you need to make, and have you identified these ones and have you executed them? So you need to write that down or keep a record of it so you can progressively move forward. If you're just stuck in the design office or just on site and you don't get that broad experience, you're going to have a problem when you do your application for registration. And plan your next project. After you've now done this one, you've written it down, you're happy with it, now plan your next one. What do you want to do with your next project? And these will be your triggers. So if you want to do your own thing, use this slide as your, as your headings, if you like. At the end of the day, after you have now done your diary or that workplace training plan, or if you use the app, then your final project or your final application, your, your, your DR will look something like this. Have that organogram ready. Remember who was ahead of you and who was underneath you and, and what's the story. Then the nature of your training and experience. Now, remember, this is the final version. This is a short version of what, what actually happened. So I'm going to first give you the short version, and the short version is because of the limit of words that you've got. I worked as a civil engineering te technologist in the structural department of whatever company, um, I progressed from 2D drawings to using 3D modeling programs to produce drawings. I continued to develop my con 
a concrete design and detailing knowledge and conducted site inspections. <clears throat> Your initial diary or pro um, project that you're going to capture is going to look more like during January of whenever, um, as a civil engineer, uh, being a technologist, uh, I was put in a position as a in the structural department that actually moved me from, from the other division into the structural department. I was a little bit lost because I knew the 2D quite well and they were using 3D modeling and, and I was a little bit concerned about that. So I went on a course and um, I figured out a little bit more on it and I, and I spoke to one of my friends. He actually helped me to to get familiar with it and I did a few drawings and I showed him the drawings and sort of we figured it out and now I'm, I'm quite cool with it. That is what your initial documentation is going to look like. Then you take it and you condense it and you use the terminology that is recognizable and that the reviewers can know and understand. It's to the point, it's clear, there's no problem with it. Then the same with the nature of problems that you address. I worked on three key projects. There are the three, <clears throat> what I want you to focus on here is for most elements, a mix, a mix of hand calculations and Procron design software modules were used to carry out the designs. Think about it. What is the problem here? The problem is no computer generated the calculations for me. I developed those calculations. I did it by hand, which means you got the ability to solve problems. Your mathematical ability is good enough. And I use program to, to help me and to do design work with me. So with, in other words, I've got a double layer of the problem solving that I did. And the statement is there. Uh, these mostly reinforced concrete structures is that sentence. The same will be with your um, diary. Your diary will say, yeah, I was a little bit concerned because I didn't know how to use Procon and I did some of the hand calculations because I didn't trust the information that came out. So I did the calculation by hand. I double checked it. I double checked it by bouncing it off to my mentor and, and we spoke about it and we're happy with it, fed it into Procon design and you know we were all happy about it. So that's what, what it will look like. Here's your condensed version. The same goes for management of materials while working on the next data center. I managed a small team of draftspeople. There's your key. Your management is I managed a small team of draftspeople. Your organogram will reflect that. That is what they want to see. Right? I also liaise with my technical director regarding the budgets. Oh, okay. So you're managing the finances here as well. And you need to have some understanding of budgets and finances. But you didn't just do it on your own. You went to the technical director and you asked for advice. Brilliant. That's what we want to see. Interaction with clients or discipline or teams, your professional team. Ali haste with the architect. Your diary will say, I can't believe it, but I actually met this architect, great guy or girl. And you spoke quite a bit about, you know, the structures and, you know, his design, what was real, what wasn't real. So you condense it in saying, I liaise with the architect on all projects. What is also important is that last sentence there, I answered structural queries from the contractor, architects, and quantity surveyor. There's your professional team. Both telephonically and via email. Method of communication is one of your outcomes in outcome number five. Which methods of communication did you use? So there you go. Health and safety, same story. Focus on what happened here as a the the the, the um, installation of, of, let me just read it i was made more aware of the um importance of managing the quality or the, the the quality of the work being completed by the contractor with an emphasis on safety remember one of your outcomes it clearly states there that excess in the code of conduct and various documents says that the code of uh, that the emphasis on health and safety is imperative, including the Environmental Act. So those are two very important things. So that tells you what happened here. Brilliant sentence is the last one. I noticed at a site visit that epoxy rebar dowels were not installed to the correct embedded depth and could be removed by hand. Big problem. By instructing the contractor, that means I take responsibility for my actions by instructing the, the contractor to redo the work as possible failure and safety risks 
was avoided. So proactive thinking, getting that done. So that is what it would look like, the condensed version of, of when you translate it over. Then, obviously, when you're done with it, you need to look at the outcomes that you've covered during these statements that you've made here and on what level you were operating on. So there you go. I've taken you through the steps. This is extremely imp important. It is fundamental to, to, to being successful in it. And it will save you a lot of heartache when you, when you get to professional registration. Do yourself a favor if you don't believe me. Go and ask the people that's already professionally registered that you know well. And ask them what was the, the biggest issue that they had. I'm not talking about the 11 outcomes or they, weren't, they didn't know or understand that. Ask them, did they document everything from day one? And how did it pan out? And see what they'll say to you. All right, so let's stop. See you, Ron. Okay. So yeah, there you go. In a nutshell. Okay, any questions? Anybody with a question? You're welcome to Muketsi. Ah, Muketsi is back with us today. <laughs> uh, good good evening, everyone. Good evening, Johan. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, I can hear you clearly. All right. Uh, well, great. So, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd just like to know, because, uh, Johan, if you remember that I contacted you, I think it was last week, um, about registering on the, on the WPTP, um, app. And I've I realized that on the occupation, on the list of occupations, it's only the engineer function that's listed there. So I'm not sure if it will be fixed as time goes. I'm not sure if you are aware of that. No, I'm not aware of it. So you're not. I don't know whether you're aware of it. Um, I've been a bit out of a lot of these stuff that's not around uh, EXA uh, because I'm not actually in the profession anymore. As you can see, I'm uh, uh, slightly older than most of you. Gizzi, are you talking about the, the Workplace Training Plan app itself? Katie? We can't hear you. Can you hear me? Jan? I can hear you, Jan. I can't hear you, Muketsi. Oh, Muketsi, are you talking about the workplace training plan app? Because you're right, I've, I've just had a look and it is only engineer that's on there. Um, I think the occupation at that stage when we when we did this, no. Yeah, thanks for bringing that under my attention because your occupations engineer, your category will be technologist, technician, and then your discipline. Okay, good that you brought me under attention about that because that needs to be fixed. Okay, um, and Paul, unmute yourself because we seems to have lost Muketsi and uh, Carry on. All right. Uh, evening, guys. Evening. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Um, just a question um, for someone who recently graduated um, with their BTEC. Um, when it comes to issues of documenting everything, do you start documenting your activities? Um, after the three years requirement of experience or when, or do you start uh, documenting immediately? Um, let's say you are put on a project and you, you've just qual uh, qualified. Do you immediately start documenting the activities then or do you uh, only consider projects that you started working on 
three years, uh, um, after three years. I don't know if I'm making sense. You want, you want, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Look, my, my advice to every single candidate, when you start working, document everything. Get acquainted with the, with the outcomes. If you're not acquainted with the outcomes, that's still fine. But just document what you're doing. It, it will help you so much. It will, later years, it will become a difficult issue for you. So my advice has always been until I've been proven, to, you know, wrong. I would say document it. I will not take that chance to kind of go three years down the line and start, try and remember what I've done when. That's me. Oh, Chris always says to us that you need to document your whole uh, career because that, that uh, the exo assessors would like to see how you progressed right from the time you finished your your national diploma. Actually, you need to very briefly even when when uh, when you uh, were doing work integrated learning during your national diploma time. Uh, you you need to just note it in, in two or three sentences uh, so that so that the exercises can see how you've grown as in from from a student to a, a candidate to, a, to to the point where you can take full professional responsibility and remember when you write your your uh, uh, stuff down always say I did this I did that I was I was uh given full responsibility to do this in other words to explain exactly uh, what what you did they don't want to know the project uh the exa guys are not registering the project they are registering you so they want to know what you've done and how you've done it and at what level you've done it that's why it says there you should actually note at which level it is and they explain the levels so remember to first download all the documents read it through understand it and then it will help you a lot to um to understand how to fill in the forms okay all right thank you i see muketsi is back <laughs> <hand up. laughs> Uh, yeah, no, uh, my, my, my Zoom always gives me a challenge when I'm connecting to, to this meeting. But anyway, um, to, to skip the introduction. Um, oh, yeah, the, the, I'm not sure if the question was heard to say that uh, on, the, on the website, the occupation that are listed there, it's only the engineer occupation. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if you are aware of one. Yeah. Like the, the idea is with the occupation, you 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 are thinking of bringing in other occupations later. So occupation will always be engineer. That's fine. My concern is that when I went onto the site now and I look at category, because your category will be um, either techno technologist or technician or engineer, and that needs to be in the category, and then your discipline yes. would be civil, mechanical, electrical. No, that that part is, is I, I saw it's fine. I just uh, I just didn't want to be sued for claiming that I'm an engineer. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> but you, you want to um, change it to, to read engineering. Okay, all right. Ah, uh, and then uh, my second question, Johan, is that um, I have been attending trainings uh, of of. Of, of topics that I have been interested in by, by certain um, uh, educational uh, institutions. For example, I've, I've, I've went on a training for sustainable energy. Uh, it's not a training per se, but uh, just as a webinar, a one hour webinar on, on, on sustainable energy, on uh, uh, combined power production, just uh, as an example on uh, design for uh, fatigue designing on, on uh, mechanical structures. However, all these are not part of my everyday work in, in the products that I'm, I'm, I'm involved in designing. So my question is, um, do they add to what EXA wants to see when, when you're compiling your, your individual development uh, uh, plan, I could say? 
if if you are attending webinars, um, smaller you know, trainings on on topics that you're not necessarily dealing with every day, but are engineering related. Of course, that always uh, assists and it shows the uh, the assessors that you are not keeping to your little narrow uh, field in engineering because you will always use that later and you will find that somehow it, it comes to good use. So you can you can say that you've done this training or that training, which was not within the, the narrow scope of what you're doing at the moment. And as I said, it, it, it shows that you haven't shown interest. It shows that you are a more rounded professional than the guy who's just sticking to his to his little narrow uh, uh, area where he uh, where, where he's working in. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, Makitsu, just to add on to that, if you look at your um, CPD, you know, continual professional development after your professional registration, there's a category 3B where you list all these things. So that just reinforces it's, it's a good thing to actually do it. All right. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, any other question? Put a hand up, unmute yourself. Don't be shy. We try and answer you. Surely you don't know everything. And surely we also don't know uh, everything. Sometimes. Uh, we... Johan? Yes. Uh, yes, no, in the absence of other questions. Um, I think this has been my my concern. I've 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 asked this question before on this platform. However, I I, I think I need to refresh my mind. Perhaps uh, maybe get also different views. Uh, the issue of minimum three years experience. I've I've heard yourself. I've also had Johan. I've I've also had other presenters and other platforms I've been on, saying that it, it, it on average it takes about. Uh, between four and five years, um, and and like I've said before, that I'm I'm genuinely aiming to actually get registered as as soon as the three years hits. So, my my question is, what would be the challenges with that? Um, does is is there maybe a risk of of pushing so or too much that it risks the quality of the work that I'm doing? Uh, will it? be visible uh, or will it be picked up that this person was not ready to actually go up the levels of, of responsibility? Uh, does such Do such things come become an issue? If, if someone says, um, I'm, I'm going to work as much as I can to make sure that I, I, I take a shot at it by the time that I get to, to three years of experience. Okay, EXA says that the minimum that you require is three years. And usually a person that, uh, yeah, first of all, the, the minimum they require is three years. You can't apply before your three years are up or you can't, um, you can't submit your application before your three years are up. Secondly, uh, usually the average person takes more than three years to get to the level of responsibility that is required and to cover all the 11 outcomes. But if you cover all the 11 outcomes sufficiently within the first three years, then, then it's great. Uh, and and uh, then, then you, you apply, but you, you mustn't apply before you, you see that you that you qualify all the 11 outcomes and that you've been working at the right level, at level E. So, um, so that is the, that's the situation. Some people, because of their work situation, they might be working for, a, 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 <clears throat> a, for some, uh, in some place where they don't get all the experience that they require, and that they don't cover all the 11 outcomes. So, and therefore they will need more than uh, more than the three years. So uh, that is, in short, what I think you should consider there. Go on. 
Yeah, look, there's a reason why Excel says you need a broad base of experience. And I, th and I think it's rather safer to have a broad experience and take longer to get your professional professional registration with the security that you have got all of the experience. I think that's the first port of call. The the reviews that we've done and what we've seen, why it why it takes longer is some of the companies do not give the candidates the necessary exposure in all of the departments to basically cover all the all the outcomes. And then you see how quickly three years become five years. So those are factors that you need to take into account. Have I seen people that's done it in three years or just after three years? Yes, I know of three people that's done it. The one was Michelle Kruger. She's now, she sort of runs her own company and she's heavily involved in FIDIC. She did a PhD while she was, um, while she was doing her training and experience reports and she had immense knowledge. And uh, that's one of the reasons why why she managed to, to register as a professional after three years. So there's various factors that, that needs to take into account. On average, and the ones that I've dealt with, 90%, five years plus. Does it make sense? Um, it, it definitely does. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay. Come on, guys, you're welcome to ask more questions. Surely you um, you have more questions. Uh, oh, there you go. my power goes off. <laughs> Never mind, I'm, I've got a backup system, so um, it won't be cut off. It's just a reminder for me to make sure that my computer is uh, not going to run flat before 8 o'clock when the power comes off. And I don't think we will be carrying on until 8 o'clock. But remember when you fill in your forms, remember to fill in what you've done, exactly how you've done it, and, and make sure that you only uh, reflect on your own experience. Don't write about what other people were supposed to be doing and think that you're not going to be called, uh, called out because Excel sometimes asks the weirdest questions. And if you've been... Uh, taking a shortcut here or there or something like that, you caught out and then you sit with a red face. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Ah, because you had to please uh, unmute yourself. Hey, evening everyone, guys. Yeah, we hear you. Hi. Hey, I'm Kosi. Here, yeah, one. Can you help me? Uh, my experience, I've worked uh, in contractors for about three to four years now. And this year, I'm planning to start registering as an engineering technician on the civil category. But then when I go through on uh, that extra registration form, like mainly it uh, looks like uh, it goes mostly with those that works um, in consultant. For example, there's a, I think it's an outcome, not sure it's outcome number one. It's uh, relating with designs and other things there. With calculations, no problem because I think I've done that uh, on my BTEC level. But then now when like the outcome will focus on the, on the designs that I've done on my workplace of which in, con, uh, in construction or when I work as a contractor, like I didn't do the any design. So can you maybe just assist me there? What approach can I take uh, on my filling my form and starting the report? Okay, read, read the the requirements very carefully there. They are looking for your problem solving uh, abilities. Now, to, to, to solve problem solving abilities is very easily proven by 
showing how you've designed things. When you design, you and, and when you talk about your designs, uh, you first of all say what the problem was and how you were going to, uh, to, to approach the problem and which uh, various uh, things you considered, which various designs you considered, and then uh, also how you decided on one specific design and how you then carried on with that. Now, if you're not doing design, you're sitting on a construction uh, site, and first of all, you are doing problem solving. Think of any problem that you find on a construction site, and you say, okay, uh, here's a big problem, and how do I approach the problem? What various uh, possibilities do I consider? And uh, how do I decide, and why do I decide on what possibility? And how do I go about solving the problem? Also, when you are now constructing anything uh, on any construction site, you are given a design that was done by a consultant. Now, you look at this design and you say, see, but uh oh, this, this consultant, he's not very experienced. And he obviously uh, didn't consider certain things. So this design of these cannot be uh, implemented properly. I've got to do something else. So then you, you, you cons again look at it and, and the, in, in, as a problem. How are you going to approach this thing? What various possibilities are there? And uh, if need be, you can then calculate uh, a, 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 if, 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 if there's calculations involved, you can and also you check the calculations and see if, see if they're, they're correct. Uh, especially sometimes you see, but this guy has, 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 has done a very, uh, his, his, his stuff is 10 times too big or 10 times too small. So you know that he, he didn't have the decimal point at the right place. And so then you carry on and you approach mm -hmm. your boss and you say, sir, this design that we've got is not uh, feasible and I need to, uh, I suggest we do this or this or this. And then obviously your boss or or you approach the, uh, the consultant directly, depends on, on, on your situation on site. And you say to him, did you consider this? Did you consider that? Uh, why did you do it this way? Because this way that you, you proposed it uh, actually is not going to work or otherwise there's another way that is much easier, uh, much better through my experience. I know that this is the way that uh, that this is going to be done much, uh, much cheaper and uh, but still giving us the same quality in the end. Uh, can we do it that way? So that's how you go about it. And also, some some uh, people sit in a, uh, in in a municipality or in a government office, where they are uh, they have to to actually um, look at designs, evaluate it, and uh, then say that yes, this is good enough. We can carry on uh, doing this or not. So, in other words, if you're in that situation, you always also check. And make sure that the person, uh, this person's design was uh, a good design, and also look at. But but this design, there's other possibilities that that may be better, or that is going to be for this specific application going to be a, a better design, and then you approach it from that side. So in other words, although you're not doing the design all on your own, you can use. The, your uh, your judgment on other people's designs to show that you are actually uh, doing the problem solving and you can develop various uh, different different um, ways to 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 solve a problem and pick the right way to solve it or the uh, more most practical or the the, the uh, best way to solve a problem and. Uh, so, so that is what EXA requires. They want you to show 
that you can do the problem solving, but they also want you to show that you can do the calculations, that you uh, that you have um, that you can apply your your theoretical knowledge uh, that you learned at uh, wherever you study. So. Um, so that is, in, in short, uh, what I would recommend you to do there. You want, would you like to add? No, that's spot on. Yeah, I, I can't add to that. That is, that's exactly it. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Uh, I did get an answer and also I just pick up a problem that maybe I can put in place on my report. Then also I'm sure I'll be able to get some sort of design on that challenge. Then maybe uh, when I'm submitting my report, yeah, to EXA, surely they will consider it. Yeah, two other things is, if you're really in a situation where you don't get any, uh, problem solving experience or anything like that. Go to, uh, and you say for instance, working in a, in a municipality and, and, and that you, you are not exposed to anything like that, but you are working on projects where a consultant is involved. Go and speak to the consultant, say to him, listen, I need to get some design experience for, for, um, for my XO registration. Can you help me to, to do some designs Give me some problems to solve uh, and, and then assess the stuff that I've done as if I am working for you. I'll do it over a weekend or something like that uh, so that you can actually uh, get the experience. The other thing I would like to say to you, you don't rely just on your practical experience. I remember clearly one, one guy who wanted to register. Now, I've, for those of you who don't know me, I've been on EXO registration for, for many, many years, uh, but I'm not on there anymore. But um, we had a guy that came and he was doing all kinds of construction work. But, uh, and then we asked him about design. They said, no, 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 we know there's, there's this work and we did these um, kaisons there. And, and I said to him, okay, now how do you determine how big these things are? No, I do it from experience. Now, you can't just do it from experience. You've got to be able to, to show that you've calculated uh, how to get there, why you're using that exact size, and so on. So, uh, so yeah, that is the, the other thing. Good, we've got two other questions. Who was first? Was it? Good one. Yeah, it was. Unmute yourself, please. Good evening to all. Okay, Jacques, you go ahead. <laughs> evening. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is my first time to attend the meeting. Yeah, and um, my great thing to you because you are you are my um, HOD at UJ. Yeah. Oh. So. <laughs> yeah, some time ago, eh? <laughs> yeah. Um, my question is: You see the way you explained. So uh, all my years I've been working and working, but I didn't have any record on what I did. So I have uh, 12 years experience, but with no record. And uh, there is also no way to find other of my uh, manager or uh, mentors. So in this case, how am I going to register? <laughs> you, want, you want to take this one? Uh, I've got some ideas. You you go first. Okay, I'll go first, and you can fill in fill in the gaps. Um, just to the to the to the previous question as well. I just thought about it. Look, the onus is up to you as a, as a candidate to get the experience, even if it means that you have to go and work for free for a certain period of time to get that experience. You do that. And I'm telling you now, the context that you pick up there in the future will stand you in good stead, just to latch on to that. Jock, yeah, look, luckily for you, when you've got lots of years of experience, you have to complete 
a training and experience outline and the training experience uh, summary. Now, let me get straight to the point. Your most crucial information is the last three years of experience. Now, surely you can remember, you know, the last three quite well. You just need to spend a little bit more time trying to figure out the years prior to that and focus heavily on the last three years of experience because that's what, what's the most important and that is what the reviewers look at. And also that you've been operating on level E. So you can't, you can't get away from it. And now for everybody that's on, on, the, on the call here or the webinar, can you now understand when I said how important it is to document the information? Now you've got a tangible summary, yeah, <laughs> somebody that can vouch for that. So, Jock, yeah, um, it's a difficult one, but if you can get together the last three years on the right level and covering all the outcomes, then you, then you should be fine. Johan, I don't know what else. How else do you get, how else do you go back in time? Yeah, you just need to uh, think carefully. And if you start thinking, you start re writing down what you've done. Uh, even if you, you, you haven't had, you didn't even ever keep a diary, but if you start writing down what you've done in the past, it comes back to you. And then you think about, okay, well, what did I do here? What was the engineering content of what I was doing? Uh, because that is what they're looking for, the engineering content. And, um, uh, so yeah, that's what I, what I would do is, is to, uh, as you once said, the th last three or five years are the most crucial. The, the others, you need to just give a, a, a more brief summary of what you've done. They want to see how you've grown as a professional. And um, uh, maybe I, am, am I correct, uh, understanding your, your question correctly, I'm not sure. Yes, yes, you are. So sit down and, and, and start writing. And as you write, it will come back. Uh, use your, you know, your free time. Sit and write down and write and write and write. Say to, okay, that year, when, what did I do there? When I was working on that job, what, what, what did I do there? Oh, yes, that job. I, before that, I was doing that. And uh, so things come back to you. And, and, and that is the best way to do. Another thing I want to say to you guys is that um, uh, one thing that we find in, in engineering is that uh, students, they like to, to just pass the, the exam. And they think that that is sufficient. Now, to just pass the exam is not really sufficient to, to, for you to, to be registering in your three years. You need to understand the engineering concepts. And that is done by, by by uh, studying diligently and understanding what the lecturer is telling you in class, not just trying to to um, to pass the exam. And my experience tells me that usually a student that gets in the 60s and 70s, he's, he's got a much better grasp of the engineering concepts. And uh, when he gets on site, he, he remembers what he learned and he can apply it. Whereas the guy who, who just passed by uh, by 50 or 53 percent, he, he forgets what he's learned and he has to learn everything again from scratch on site to understand the concepts and it takes him a lot long, longer to to uh, to get there. So I actually offered to to one of the universities that I'll come and speak to their students and explain this to them because you don't know it as a student. And you decide, no, 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 I'm just going to do the minimum because if I pass, I pass and I'm an uh, a engineer or a technician or a technologist, but you actually are not. And you find that uh, if you're a technician and you work under an engineer that was just passing these subjects, uh, scraping through, then those guys are threatened by a technician or a technologist that knows the concepts well. So um, just as a matter of interest. In any case, I'm just uh, talking now about things that you not, not necessarily want to hear. 
Let's hear any other questions. Kutwana, you've you're sitting down in the group. Yes, yes, yes. I just wanted to ask for clarity on the well defined, uh, especially for outcome one problem and broadly defined for, for technologists. Can someone assist in terms of just simplifying it so that I can understand it better? Does it refer to the problem that we're encountering or does it refer to a project or how should I approach it uh, when I'm trying to answer that? And what is the difference between a well-defined and a broadly defined uh, problem? Okay. Thanks. When, when your boss gives you a job uh, and you need to now do that job and, and, and uh, obviously you see it as, as a problem that you have to solve. And he explains everything in detail to you. Look, you need to do this and this and this and this and this. Uh, beware of this and beware of that. And all that is well defined. Broadly defined is if you was to say to you, look, there's the problem. Uh, you have to sort it out yourself. Uh, you need to go and find the best way and all that. Uh, without telling you what the const constraints are and... Uh, what the limitations are or anything. He expects you to, to uh, make use of your understanding of the engineering concepts to be able to solve the problem and to do the job. So I think that has given you the two extremes uh, and, 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 and then broadly defined as somewhere in between where your boss just tells you, look, here's a job. Uh, Go and do that, but just uh, here's one or two things that you need to take cognizance of. Uh, and, and, but it, it doesn't tell you everything. You've got to use your engineering ability, your engineering knowledge, and your experience to, to, uh, to, to define it. And, and yes, you can read the, 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 the definitions of EXA, but in the end, it is very vague. And um, different people define it and understand it in different ways. So it, 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 explaining the uh, levels of, of problems is not necessarily well defined to, to explain it. It's, it's, it's not so easy. It is in, in some cases uh, broadly defined and, 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 and so on. So I hope I answer you. You want, you want to add maybe? Yeah, yeah, and that is a difficult one, and it is vague. Um, I've I've done a sort of explanation that in one of the one of the programs that I've done in the past, between you know a complex broadly and a well defined find activity. I think the the best way to tackle that one, quite is to look at the first three outcomes, uh, define, investigate, analyze, and then come up with a solution. So the first thing you need to do is identify, is it a problem or isn't it a problem? I'm taking the long road here, but it might help. Then after you've done that, then you state the, the, the problem that you're facing. Then you need to design a solution for that problem. And the only way you can design a solution for that problem is by using your contextual knowledge. And this is where the levels are very apparent because you're Diploma level of contextual knowledge versus your BTEC, it's different. This is your engineer is different. And that's why it's 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 broadly well defined and complex. To answer your question with in a little bit more detail is when it's when it's a well defined, the 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 various acts, the standards, the codes, all of them are there. They're well defined and you operate within those boundaries. You do not, as a technician, go out of those boundaries. You don't go and look at the standards or the rules or any one of those given documents and operate outside of them. Whereas a broadly defined means, yes, those standards exist, 
the law exists, the um, ISO, all of those exist. But there are certain situations where user technologists are allowed to move outside of those boundaries by saying, yes, I, I've got that knowledge, I know what it is, but in this specific instance, I need to move a little bit of out of it and come up with other solutions without endangering the health and safety of people or the environment and use that as my solution. Whereas in engineers with a complex one, they can move totally out of those boundaries. And I think that's the easiest way to explain it, if that, if that helps. I think there's another thing I can add, John. And that is that uh, yeah. Jacques will remember that some of the lecturers that he had in our department at uh, UJ uh, gave you a, a recipe to design, uh, whether it be, so for instance, a structural design, how to des de de design a column or a beam or a, a, a slab or whatever. He gave you a recipe. Whereas if you in 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 uh, the four-year universities, they don't give you a recipe. They say to you, "Go and find out how you 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 uh, you should design it. Go and read up. Go and understand why you are doing it. If you're given a recipe, you're not understanding why you are actually doing doing this or that or the next thing. You need to understand why you're doing it, and uh, that is why it is complex and and you and sometimes they in in, in uh, physics and stuff they guess, say to you go and develop this from first principles in other words go and find out and not just take the obvious first uh, um, what's the name the first uh, res result that comes to mind to, to solve your problem the first uh, first thing that comes to mind use think of the various different possibilities that you can use okay yes Buketsi, are you back yeah no Jan, uh, the, the system keeps on kicking me out but i but i stand strong uh, but but yeah no to the to, to add to the previous question um I, I, as I was listening to, to the gentleman ask there, I, for example, I am, I am tasked with uh, doing design work, uh, producing the uh, models, uh, and assemblies and the whole assembly of, of uh, a rail wagon, and also tasked with doing some welding design on a section of the roof. Now, there is a, a standard that exists guiding on how to do a welding design. Uh, that is the British Standard EN 15085-3 of 2007. Um, that, that speaks about uh, the welding of railway vehicles and components. Now, it, it is quite straightforward on, on how to design welds based on the material that you're given. Uh, there are thicknesses. Um, it goes as far as as specifying uh, welding positions and and um, taking into cognizance, uh, um, like I said, materials. And I'm just trying to get uh, other factors here. Uh, uh, imperfections uh, and and quality levels uh, for imperfections and all of that. Now, like. What Johan just explained, when there's a standard that exists and you're sort of not going out of the standard, is it broadly defined or well defined? If if I have to take into consideration factors like the material that's available, the levels of skills that are available to do the welds, therefore I would have to design according to what the company has currently, uh, the time limits, uh, and all of that. If if it is that, uh, I could say complex in inverted commas. Do I then classify it as a, as a broadly defined or or a well defined problem, uh, engineering problem? Well, if you work to the standards, obviously, and you you don't go beyond the standards, then then it's it's well defined. Uh, at the moment, you you have to to 
to go outside the, the guidelines and for, for some good reason, you need to be able to say, why are you going to, to do that? Why are you using your engineering judgment? And in your judgment, why are you doing it? So that, and, and, and the further away you go from, from, uh, from the exact standards and guidelines and uh, specifications, the more you work, work into broadly and, and, and complex problems. All right. Oh, thank you, Jan. Any other questions? Go on, guys. Am I having an early night tonight? Vitalis, Aguba, please, you are unmuted, carry on. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Johan, for the opportunity. Um, on my own side, uh, just uh, all about the, this report writing. You know, there are some areas they will limit you on the words that you are going to put in. Let's, as, let's for instance, uh, the nature of the problem. If you check a uh, um, uh, technologist uh, report template, so they limit you saying that you should state in 20 to 30 um, words. So please just advise if one goes beyond that, what's going to be the repercussion? I, I don't understand your question very well. You say that you... If you exceed 30 words, they said you must put 30 to 20 to 30 words. But if you exceed 30 words, is that, is that going to be a penalty? If you exceed safety work. Yeah, Johan, that is, that's the question of, you've got a word count that you have to stick in with, within your training and experience report. Certain of the headings, they say, explain in 20 or 30 words, um, how did you manage the project or whatever the case might be. It's the headings with the words next to it. The answer to that, to that question, number one, you should try and stay within those boundaries of the word count. That is important. However, if it's justifiable, then you can go slightly over the word count. It won't be a major issue, but it needs to be justifiable. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. If you if it's if it says 20 to 30 and you go to say 35 or 40, it will be fine. If you start creaching onto 50, 60, then your 2,000 word count will be gone and it will become three or four thousand, and that's a problem. Um, that's why those examples that I've given you, so those condensed versions, you, you stick to the point, you use the right la language and you, and you condense it. To answer your question, be careful if you go over, they're not gonna throw it out because of that, but don't, don't, don't go crazy on that. Okay, thank you. Does that answer you? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, I misunderstood your question. <laughs> but that's why it's good to have two of us here. What would you guys like us to talk about next time? Tumelo, put a hand up. Yes, evening, evening, you are. Um, evening, everyone. Um, mine is just a, a quick one. I don't know if maybe we'll, we'll go into it in the next... Uh, next session or not but um, I was just curious about um, if it would be possible for us to maybe or for you guys to just maybe give us tips and tricks uh, of some sort uh, in terms of preparing for uh, uh, the PR interview. For the interview? Yeah. Uh, you want, I think we've done that before so you should have it on your website. It's not to say that we're not going to do it again because We've, this is probably number 33 or something of all the, the talks we've done in the last three years. So, uh, yeah. uh, and we've covered various of the, of the subjects more than once. So, uh, and, and we will be covering, uh, repeating certain stuff again. So yes, we will be looking at um, uh, how to 
approach your your interview. I think that this may be a good idea to use for next time. But you can go and look at uh, at the uh, professional CPD web website. John, will you explain to the guys how they must go about to find the previous recordings of what we've done and what they look like? Yes, I've put it in the chat. So um, the link is there. But let me do a quick screen share. I was just going to say, do that. Right. So do you see it there? Do you see the web address? <clears throat> That's the one that I posted in the in the chat. Then you've got all of the various um, talks in here. There's two pages of them. All those with a with a black. Yeah. The extra sign on. Yeah. See, there's some other stuff for interest. And uh... okay. Yeah, I think maybe two topics. The one will be, you know, how to how to prepare for the for the interview. That's a good one. Look, ideally, what I would like to do is maybe set up a mock interview and record it and show the mistakes or show, uh, because that goes hand in hand with your PowerPoint presentation, not PowerPoint, your presentation skills, which is a topic by itself that one can can maybe get, um, what's the name involved, to, to talk about that. Um, okay. I'm going to forget his name again. He's got my cousin's name. Uh, Andrew. Oh, okay. That's the one. And then maybe maybe just have a, a session on what is the difference between the various complex, broadly, and well-defined issues and how to clearly see. Look, I'm scared to tackle that one, but <laughs> but I'm sure we can work something. Hey, well, we can do that one on a, on a, on a, on a CPD webinar. I think you're right. <laughs> we maybe should. But we could do it in short for, for this, for this, yeah. uh, what's the name as well. Yeah, that is the nice, that. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's look at it. But I like your idea of, of setting up a mock interview to show the various uh, mistakes that people make. So, uh, uh, Johan? Yes, Tumela. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't mind volunteering to be a sample for that mock interview, if, if you'll have me. John, there you have a volunteer. Oh, great. Tamela, my email address is there on the side. Please send me with your contact details and um, yeah, I will start planning it. Okay, perfect. Do you see my email address there? Um, I'll just go to the chat now. now. Uh, Just repeat it, Johan. There you go. Yes, Johan. Johan at six cds. Yes, I, I see it. Okay. Okay. Now I'll definitely take your mail there. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, as a side note, yes, may I speak? Think. Uh. As, as, as a, on a light, and I have been friends since 2009. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice to have friends who take initiative. Yeah, that is rather nice. And I can tell you one thing, the people that volunteer are the ones that does the best in the interview process because they've break, broken the ice. And they're not scared to to go through that process because it's like exercising for for a race. You you do it a few times and just become better and better at it than going there cold. Yeah. Okay, Nkosi, you uh, you put a hand up there. Yes, carry on. Hey, I just <coughs> wanna check with you, uh, Johan Muti. Do you have maybe some mentorship programs or this extra registration where 
they we as candidates maybe we do these reports and maybe we submit uh, to our mentors on the program just before we can submit them to exa and also i believe if maybe the the program you guys have can also work together with our mentors that we are busy with them uh, at where we are working when we are filling these reports we have like something like those programs Jorn, would you like to go there? No, look, we don't have a structured program as such. I think it's a good idea to, to start looking at something. I think it's a good value add. I think it might be also valuable to have a CPD and a, a version where, but, uh, but this is where we're going to help you. We're going to need your help is by inviting all of your mentors to a webinar like this and we discuss the outcomes we discuss the issues um it's like train the mentors kind of thing not that they need training per se but but some of them would like to find out a little bit more um i think it's a good initiative if you wouldn't mind just pop an email through to me and um, let me mold it over and discuss it with you and in the cpd committee and then see what we can come up with yeah, you never know it. I think that EXA is also looking at to provide specific training for mentors because EXA is not always happy with the with the quality of mentoring that they that uh, applicants get. So uh, uh, I remember Chris saying to me that they're seriously looking at that. So uh, just as a matter of interest, and also I think we should uh, approach a number of the CETAs to help us with funding. Um, and yeah but the problem is there's so many of them and each and every one of them has their own different ideas so other questions can we call it a day thank you guys perfect as i said before uh this is brought to you by the institute of professional engineering technologists and uh, we try and help anybody within the profession to to get a better understanding of of registration and uh, but uh, the better you prefer prepare the better you the chances as you on said you know the more you practice uh for uh for a competition or something the better your chances to to uh to get to the other end i mean if you if you unfit and you haven't uh, run a, a marathon yet, then don't try and do it the first time. So first start training and make sure that you understand everything. And uh, download the forms from EXA, read them, study them, understand what they're doing. If you don't understand, then, uh, then ask questions. And then you start writing a draft of your stuff and you can start with that draft long before you actually submit your your registration application the sooner you start and and documenting the stuff and actually using the exa app application form to document it and and getting the signatures once you've you've completed specific the older stuff um that is that is the road to to successful registration. So thank you everybody for joining us today. And uh, we hope to be here in three or four, two or three weeks time again, and uh, to talk about um, the next subject. And right, thanks, that, John. That interview, that mock interview, I think that is a, a very good idea. Uh, have a good evening and um, just look out for the potholes and so on and good luck. Thank you guys. Good night. Thanks, John. Thank Cheers. Thank Cheers, everyone.